Everybody who is anybody in my small town could tell you about the disappearance of the Lechtler family. Some could probably write a book, more elegantly than me, because it's just one of those stories. A mystery with more questions than answers, but I'll do my best. The year is 1994. A man calls to reserve a room at the White Valley Hotel. He needs the reservation for the next night, and he will pay cash. Only cash. If he can't pay cash, he will speak to the owner, Billy, who is a known pushover and desperate for the money. The man is specific about the room. Number 13. No exceptions, no switches. He will require a king-size bed with two twins and a bottle of brandy wrapped in gift paper, ready to go on the dresser. He will also need towels for four. The desk and service staff go about their preparations. The bellhop drive to the store and buy the brandy. The maids shuffle two extra beds into room 13. They clean and clean and clean again, because this is a new client, and business is bad. Business is always bad in White Valley. The next day, the Lechtlers show up. According to the bellhop, the father appears educated. He wears thick, horn-rimmed glasses, which fit snugly over buzzed and graying hair. He is dressed in a brown, button-down shirt with fresh iron black slacks and polished shoes. The mother, decked out in a floral print dress, ushers the wailing children like braying sheep. The Lechtlers have one boy and one girl. Each are under 10 years old, and the boy appears to be sick, because his coughs and wheezes echo through the empty halls of the hotel. Numerous guests hear his hacks throughout the night. Mr. Leckler hands over an envelope. The sleeve is filled with money. He doesn't offer an explanation, and the White Valley staff doesn't ask for one. The clerk confirms the booking. The bellhop leads the family to their room. Number 13 is nothing extraordinary. On the surface, it looks like all the other rooms. A large and complicated armoire stores everything from extra power outlets to a mini fridge. There is a bathroom at the back, with a stand-in shower and a small coat closet beside it. An oak desk sits catty-cornered against the wall, and the king bed is decorated lushly, with plush pillows, a fuzzy blanket, and prototypical cream-colored sheets and comforters. A small window on the west side looks out into the lake below. The room can actually seem pretty peaceful, considering the modern circumstances, if it catches you at the right time of the day. The lectors say goodnight. When the bellhop leaves for the evening, the father is perched at the desk, with a thousand papers spread out in front of him, and a fresh glass of liquor at the ready. Some folks assume Mr. Lechtler is a doctor, others swear he is a scientist. It doesn't really matter at this point, because the end result is the same. By morning, every single member of the Lechter family is gone. That's it. Gone. Vanished without a trace. The room is made up, the bags are gone, the papers are gone. The twin beds have small creases in the sheets, where the children must have sat momentarily, but the bedding itself is barely disturbed. The shower in the bathroom is damp. Somebody must have used it, but every other trace of the family dropped from the face of the hotel. The bellop calls White Valley PD. Billy doesn't want that, at first. He insists the guests went out. Maybe they would come back, and then wouldn't they be furious, launching an investigation into something as simple as a breakfast trip? But he must know the argument is futile. His employees are worried. The boy was sick. The woods outside the hotel are vast and foreboding. Anyone venturing out that late at night in the 90s risks something serious. The police comb the hotel with a fine tooth comb. Nothing turns up. They check the basement. They check the room. The property. They look into the name Lechtler, to no avail, and declare it more likely than a pseudonym. Soon the police are looking for the town's help, ridiculously instead of the other way around. Stories about the family volley around like a game of telephone. Some people say the Lechlers were spies. Some say they were witness protection. But the one story, the most disturbing of all, and the one that sits in the forefront of every local's mind, even if they don't mention it, is that the Leckler family was murdered. The small town starts to lock their doors at night. A criminal investigation into Billy the owner begins a week later. The police traced the mysterious call and found that it originated from his cell phone. Officers move to bring him in for questioning, but that night, a snowstorm slams White Valley. Billy is out for an errand probably to stock the hotel with groceries, and he doesn't notice the finely packed ice holding up a pothole on the road. Treadless tires spin helplessly for traction. The front of Billy's station wagon catches a maple tree. The back half flies off the road altogether. Some folks say they could hear the impact from a mile away. The town ambulances rush to the scene. The police are hot on their tails, but both are too late. Billy Walker passes from his injuries on the side of the highway, and with him, 
so too does the mystery of the Lechtler family. Some people viewed the car accident as an admission of guilt. Billy must have known the end was near, so he hopped in a station wagon in the middle of a blizzard and did his best to hightail it out of town. He was running. He was a coward. He must have killed them. He probably dumped them in the miles of woods that surround his creepy little hotel. He always was such a weird looking guy on the surface, and the crash confirms unreasonable prejudices for a lot of unreasonable people. Time passes without any fresh leads. The story becomes sort of a tall tale. They say that every small town has its secrets, and if that's true, none seem more fitting than the legend of the Lechtlers. The police closed ranks and withheld the information. The details became warped over time. Some say Mr. Lechtler was an astronaut. Some say he worked for the CIA. Nobody knows for sure, of course. It's all conjecture, but the truth rarely gets in the way of a good story. Certainly not in White Valley. Fast forward to today. The hotel still stands, though it is under different owners now. A nice older couple bought the place at the start of the decade. The Abbots love the historical relevance of the old building. The hotel has its own stories, they insisted, a rich and complicated history that has nothing to do with the Lechtlers. The grounds were used by abolitionists, after all, and it was good for them. It should be good for the brats of White Valley, and their bastard out-of-town cousins. The Abbots hire college kids, home from state, and high school students, because they know they can be paid less. There are a few guests here and there, but business is just as dead now as it must have been 20 years ago. I worked at the desk of the White Valley Hotel for about two weeks before it happened. That evening, Mr. and Mrs. Abbott had some business to take care of out of town. Normally, they would dedicate the night shift to an older guy named Jed, but Jed was sick, and the options for his replacement were few and far between. They settled on me, begrudgingly, because they knew I majored in hospitality and hotel management at university. I looked forward to the opportunity as a chance to hone my skills for the future. I barely even thought about the Lechtlers. At that point, most people my age forgot. We had four sets of guests staying with us for the night. Mr. Sloan was visiting his mother on Mott Street, but she only had one bed, so he elected to use ours instead. The Petersons were on a cross-country road trip. The Hinkies lost power in the recent storm, and Tommy and Sarah Measler, the teenage couple from town, were looking to stay in the only alleged haunted spot in town. Room number 13. I know what you might be thinking. Why didn't the Abbots board it up? Why did they still rent it out? The answer is not as interesting as you might hope. Simply put, the police never asked them to, and so they never did. Any tourism is good tourism. Tom and Sarah were not the first to ask to stay in that room. Over the years, many ghost hunters, psychics, or paranormal whatevers had asked to rent room 13 for the night. They came in with their cameras, EMF readers, and bundles of money at the ready. They left disappointed. On the night of my overnight watch, I posted up in the lobby with a big book and a rum-filled thermos. I knew the night would pass slowly, but I never expected to be so bored. I walked around the property aimlessly. I took in the drifting snowstorm from the lobby. I hopped to every one of the guests' requests on a dime because it gave me something to do. But the calls died down around midnight, and then it was silent. I kept myself awake by thumbing through an old short story collection by Stephen King. I don't remember the name. There was a tell in there about an upper class woman who found a secret highway through the woods in Maine. The shortcut took miles and hours from the journey to her summer home. Each time she arrived well before her gardener expected, and each time she refused to tell him the exact route. The story goes on to discuss a night where they finally made the journey together. The route is winding. The trees are leaning to make the road narrower and narrower. A creature jumps out into the street, larger than any the gardener has ever seen and he swears they hit it. He swears he sees it, stuck to the rim. But the woman keeps driving, and laughing, and smiling salaciously his way. The phone rang. Have you ever been so captivated by a story that the fringes of reality disappear around you? That was my experience. I stared blankly at the receiver for a moment. I looked back into the storm. I couldn't stop thinking about the shortcut. Where did they go? What did they hit? Could such a place really exist? Then, the phone rang again. I picked it up and was immediately greeted by the panicked voice of Tommy Walsh. You have to come up here, he whispered. Something smells like death. I laughed out loud and let the mystery of the King story fall around me. Sometimes the pipes in our old hotel backed up. Sometimes the staff neglected to do a thorough clean, but unusual smells would not be very high on my list of unusual hotel guest requests. I grabbed a mop bucket and a plunger and waltzed down the hall. 
whistling like an asshole, with a clear and unsuspecting look plastered into my innocent beady eyes. I knocked on the door. Sarah opened up immediately. She had a blanket wrapped around her face. Tom was in the corner with his head sticking out of an open window. I wanted to ask what happened, but a moment later, the smell hit me, and then I didn't have to ask. I can't use enough adjectives to describe the pure stench. It smelled like body odor and sweat rolled into a disgusting tortilla of old meat and beans. Have you ever left a piece of chicken or steak out of the freezer for too long? Have you ever let the maggots tear it apart bit by bit? Take that stink and add a thick layer of something inexplicably sweet on top of it. I couldn't get it out of my nostrils. The smell invaded my lungs. I turned to gag and even then the rancid stench still stayed with me. We noticed it before bed, Sarah started. We thought maybe just the old pipes, but now? I nodded and proceeded cautiously to the bathroom with the plunger in front of me, brandished like a katana. Sarah paced behind me, nervously. Then she shook her head. Not over there, she murmured. Here. She pointed to the closet. A lot of uncomfortable thoughts went through my head. Panic crept up my spine like a bad trip. My mouth suddenly felt dry and my throat spasmed uncontrollably. I walked over to the closet and thrust open the door, dramatically, hardly looking at what might be on the other side. It was empty. Tommy shouted out that they tried that before and a fresh symphony of vomiting shook his frail frame. I looked around and found the single light bulb in the closet. There were coat hangers and shelves, and an old iron hanging on the wall. Tom's bulky north face sat parked next to Sari's more fashionable Patagonia. I moved them aside to search for something, anything that could be the source of that horrible, gut-wrenching odor. It had to be nearby. The room reeked. I could barely breathe through my t-shirt. My fingers caught a break in the paneling. I pulled back, expecting it to stay in place and fell on my ass once the entire wall came crashing down. Standing still as scarecrows were a mother and two children. A thousand wires connected to batteries, skin, and other foreign devices littered every inch of the small enclosed space. I looked down at my hand and saw a sticky, gooey substance, and I couldn't figure out why. It was only when Sarah screamed that I noticed the horrible ball of wax sitting beside the children. Entrails and blood sat bundled together in a misshapen little pile of blood encased by a dusty pair of slacks and a faded button-down shirt. Sitting on top of the ensemble was a distinct pair of horn-rimmed glasses. I couldn't stop staring. Tommy couldn't stop screaming. A thick liquid leaked out into the closet and puddled by my feet. I turned to get the mop absurdly before Sarah's cold hand caught my shoulder. They're breathing, she whispered. Look. My bloodshot eyes focused on the woman's floral dress. For a moment, she stayed still. Then her chest inflated. Her eyes fluttered and she exhaled. The children followed suit. I don't remember running from the room. I don't remember the phone call to the police. The only thing I can clearly remember, clearly, is standing outside in the snow with Tommy, Sarah, Mr. Stone, the Petersons, and the Hinkies all at my side. We were desperate for answers. We needed answers. But straight answers are hard to come by in White Valley. Mr. and Mrs. Abbott were devastated when the government seized the hotel. They called it eminent domain, and the G-men offered a fair price, but it was barely enough to cover the retired couple's affairs. For months, White Valley was swarmed by black paneled vans and folks in suddenly matching black suits. The locals begged the agents for answers in the coffee shops and stores around town, but the government stayed quiet. To date, no official explanation has been given for the disappearance and resurgence of the Lechtler family and no one truly knows what happened to the surviving family members. But a small town will always have its rumors. Some say that Mr. Lechtler must have been a scientist. Some say he must have been involved in cryogenics. What other explanation made sense? The movies all said it was possible, and the government is always a step behind science fiction. Some say that Mr. Lechtler took the opportunity to debut his work when he found out his son was sick. The old owner, Billy, must have known about the plan to some degree. Some say it is entirely possible that Billy's secret died on the night of his car crash, leaving the family to fester, hibernating for 25 years, technically alive behind the false wood panel. When the father finally passed, probably from natural causes, the smell awakened their hiding spot, and at long last, blew the lid off the entire operation. But it's not the mystery itself that haunts me, not exactly. When I'm awake in bed, finding the memory of the Lecklers, fighting the smell, 
trying desperately to find sleep against irreversible anxiety, I think about the children. Why are they awake? Were they aware? I pray to God often, and I think about that question every time. What kind of God would allow children to be awake? Because I cannot imagine any worse hell than being trapped in a closet, completely helpless, while the rotting fat and pieces of your father drips listlessly onto your shoulder. I hear Mr. Reedhide is very upset. Very upset indeed. I didn't need warning twice. He wouldn't care what the de Coughlin brothers had been doing. Wouldn't care why they'd been dropped by my place. Wouldn't care whether they'd left or not. The only thing that would matter would be that he owned them. Outright. And no one knew where they were now. There was nothing to say. Nothing that would be listened to anyway. With the vanishings getting worse, the whole city was on edge. I had to disappear before someone did it for me. Thanking Terry for the heads up, I kicked my regulars out and gave the place a once over. Assuming I was still around later, I might want to come back again. Taps were purged and sealed. Couldn't do much about the fridges. Not at a short notice. I mourned the state of my stock and locked the place. Not too tight mind, the less damage those fuckers caused breaking in, the better. Wouldn't be long now. Everyone knew the bar. It was morbid outside. Night sky a dull gray. Bitter wind doing a fantastic job finding the gaps in my frayed scarf. The city had a nasty habit of channeling the stuff, sending it screaming down alleys to attack the unwary. Clutching my faded greatcoat closer and stuffing my hands in my pockets, I dodged between pools of sodium light, winding my way through the blocks to my apartment. Couldn't be too careful, though they probably knew where I lived anyway. I paused at the corner of the block, weighing my paranoia, my uncertainty. Better safe than sorry, probably. I crouched. Isn't that what they always said? Disrupt sight lines or something? Would it really help? Teetering out from the wall, grasp slipping on the moist concrete, I glanced down the street, the shadows pregnant with danger. Was there a set of binoculars glinting from the shadows? An unfamiliar car sitting outside the bodega? A cleaning van that had no business at this hour. Nothing stood out. It was the same red brick and concrete buildings. Same potholes, same failing streetlights, same ratty cars parked horrifically. I finally spotted him, in the last place I'd expect, squatting on my building's front steps. Reedhide didn't put much stock in subtlety, that much was clear. The grunt had to be at least 6'6", built like a wall. From the leather gloves, to the suspicious bulge in the raincoat, to the arms bigger than my damn head, he wasn't here for a quiet chat. Even if I was armed, I doubt I could take him. And the only things in my pockets right then were an outdated phone, a near-empty wallet, and a bottle opener. Jason Bourne, I'm not. My thighs were screaming in protest, but I knelt there, mind racing, drinking the details. Couldn't use a card. Man was connected in ways that I daren't imagine. Any business owner around here would turf over cash point footage. Christ, I would've. Didn't have much cash, and without getting to the apartment, I couldn't get more. My car keys were there too. Fuck. Try the cops? Hell. Might as well hang myself. Wouldn't make it through custody. Thoughts in abject turmoil, I was dragged to the present by a sudden sound. A tuneless whistle started up, and the brute's eyes snapped open. My heart nearly leaving through my ears, I frantically searched for the source. Was this it? Had I been spotted? But it was just a drunk, wandering aimlessly from a side alley. Unsteady steps stumbled out onto the street. Sidewalk, long forgotten. A murky bottle swung from one arm, and a wonky roll-up from the other. Under the lit backdrop, I couldn't see his details, but the whistling was piercing, meandering, and utterly devoid of rhythm. Impossible to ignore. The moron sure had timing. My pulse began to recover, and squinting hard, I finally caught sight of him as he passed under a streetlight. It was Jansen. He was a regular at my place. Perennial waste. Suspicious smell, no fix to bold. Worse, he was coming my way. I swiftly pulled back from the corner, praying he wouldn't spot me. Pressed against the hard surface, I realized my back was slick with sweat, soaking through my shirt. I wasn't cut out for this. Why had those dumb fucks got drunk in my bar before vanishing? Couldn't they have picked a better night to disappear off the face of the earth? Alas, flashbacks took too long, and Jansen's hesitant footsteps were practically falling in my direction. Better make the first move myself. If he shouts my name, I'm a corpse. 
I readied myself and, as he crossed the corner, snatched him from his brief return to the sidewalk, pulling him into the nearest side alley. Hey, oh my, <laughs> if it ain't owner s Don't say my fucking name, you drunk twat. I tightened my grasp on his collar and deeply wished I hadn't. He sagged within his coat as his knees headed in a different direction. A waft of something that made me gag washed from the slit. What even was that? It smelled disturbingly like fermenting meat. Tyking a spluttering drag on a sagging roll-up, he bared his crumbling teeth in a rictus grin. Heh, <laughs> do dead men care about names? The fuck do you know about that? Reed Hyde's goons are at your place. <laughs> Doesn't take a genius. Shame about your bar, huh? You cunt, it's like I'm already dead. What I wouldn't give to be that trashed right now. Maybe I wouldn't notice being tortured for the information that I don't have. <laughs> Aren't you? Unless, of course, you don't have to be. He peered expectingly at me, and it was clear he'd won. This better not be one of your drunken... I'm homeless, aren't I? He ruthlessly cut across me, words slurred. We all survive in our own ways. Now get your hands off me and I'll tell you a secret. I let go and he sagged against the wall, head lolling. If this was my best shot, he was right. I was dead. Pulling himself upright and stroking his tangled mane, he looked me dead in the eye, or as near as he could estimate. His pupils were unfocused and stared in slightly different directions, yet as cloudy as they were, the irises glowed in the dim light. Had his eyes always been like that? The fine veins seemed closer to purple than blue. Listen, you want to head to the sewers. Don't give me that expression, it's perfectly fine, you know? Safe-ish. There are entrances all over. All over. Dragged at the cigarette, washed it down with god knows what. One behind the bins next street over. Got a knife, don't you? Once you're down there, look for the arrows. On at intersections. We've got an encampment. Place it doesn't flood. I'll be seeing you. Don't get lost. You can't be serious. It sounded about as dangerous as just running out of state. I didn't have time for playing drunk runaround. A greasy torch was thrust in my hand, and Jansen began his lurching parade to the far end of the alley. Just don't get lost. The only phrase he left behind. As he reached the light of the street, he threw the butt pointedly stamping on a grating at the edge of the nearest building. Cocky bastard. Jogging over, it was the same as any other, bearing a seal on the iron surface. I didn't know the city heraldry, but it looked different somehow, like a vast city gate off some ancient flag. The fuck was I supposed to do with this thing? It looked like it weighed a ton. A screech of tires from a few blocks over relocated my heartbeat once more, and set my vision sweeping widely across the road. They ruled these streets. This wasn't sustainable. I'd try the damn sewers. Setting the tiny blade of the bottle opener into an inlaid groove in the slab, I pushed gently, and to my astonishment, heard a slight click from within. Throwing my weight on the thing, it slid inwards, and then to the side, on well-oiled runnels. It didn't seem like the way to make a manhole open, but it's not like I'm an expert. Taking a last glance around, I slipped inside. The ladder was cool, but dry, and torch in hand, I climbed downward enough to return the slab into place. There was a small handle on the other side, and a repeat of the same design on the surface. No way I'd lock myself down here though, I had to admit. It was exceptional workmanship, city spending its money in weird places again. Holding the torch in my teeth, I began my descent, the narrow shaft on the ladder well opening out gradually onto a large tunnel that could fit a train. Minutes later, I reached the bottom, slipping slightly on the slick metal bars flakes of paint redecorating the floor. Filthy liquid flowed down the center, and two concrete raised walkways were on either side, an alarming bronze line set in the stone halfway up the wall to denote where flood water would reach. That drunk fuck better have been on a level, or I was going to vanish as thoroughly as those brothers. The smell wasn't pleasant, but hardly as bad as I was expecting. Clearly the proper sewage ran on a different line. Wrapping the scarf around my face for scant protection, I pointed the light at the wall to either side of the ladder, and instantly felt my stomach drop. That drunk motherfucker! My voice bounced its way down the piping, tone shifting to a mocking metallic falsetto as it echoed back. I resolved to stay silent, but the curses poured out inside my head, and it felt like punching the wall. Four different arrows, with a variety of symbols painted in different directions. Two were red, with tiny glyphs of waves, which I assume showed the water danger areas. I had no interest in waterboarding myself. One was black, with a tiny picture of a bottle, and one was purple, with a similarly tiny knife. Food and drink, maybe? But why in two different directions? 
I knew the hobos had ways of communicating with each other, but I wish Jansen had stopped to explain. Following arrows was all well and good, but what the hell now? I shone my meager light in both directions, yet there was little to see. One shadowed path seemed to be curving slightly upward as the current flowed from it, and in the other, a distant splashing suggested the pipe joined with some other concourse, or worst case, dropped deeper into the city's underbelly. Beyond that, the bare gray surfaces left me with little to go on. Choosing the former, I glanced back at the wall again. Purple it was. No way was I getting further from the surface than I had to be. The closer I was to an exit, the better. I trudged my way up the slope. Bins came and passed, but the surroundings didn't change. Time was hard to pinpoint down here, but it wasn't taking an age. The scenery, such as it was, began to blur into one. Gray on gray. Endless splashing. Same channel, same walkways. Same disconcerting bronze watermark. Same intermittent purple arrows. My feet ached from the endless druggery. Ignoring the branching side paths, I stuck with the directions, ever onward. After what felt like hours, the platform widened out as I reached the channel's origin. I could have passed halfway across town by now, and I'd have no way of telling. I'd long since lost any idea of what direction I'd be facing on the surface. The dirty water fell from a metal grate halfway up the wall, and down into a deep pool before it started on its meandering journey. No way to head up, unless I brought cutting tools and learned to fucking fly. I swung the flashlight and found, to my disbelief, that I would no longer lead it. A service tunnel that had been broken into, remains of the security door hanging limp from the hinges. A dusky orange light emanated from within, like the safety lamps miners used to use. Returning the torch to a coat pocket, I walked over and inspected the passage. Same plain concrete, tracks on the dusty floor, and on the wall, the rusty remains of screws, with fragments of an off-white plastic, a sign that had been long since removed. At least there weren't any more storm drains. I ran less risk of drowning. Following the passage, steps upward, I cursed my boots, hard soles broadcasting my presence. I moved forward in tense expectation, shoulders tight, yet no one came to check. No noise greeted me from the rooms ahead. Shouldn't I have met people by now? Boots ringing in the ominous silence, I trekked on forward, coming to a yellow wooden door, still intact. A purple gate had been daubed on it, mirroring the design from the streets above. What was with their obsession? These hobos sure loved their theater, but it was starting to get on my nerves. Pushing it open, I was greeted by the rank stink of human waste. Ah, society. A positive sign. Grinning nervously, I stepped forward, only to find myself on a metal gantry overlooking a deep room. Space fell away and stretched below me. The walls were slightly moist, lichen growing in the corners, lit softly by the loose emergency lights adorning the ceiling. Across the gap were the broken remains of pipes, hopefully not crucial systems. Suffocating after leaving the water behind would be an embarrassment. The sudden sense of space could be felt on the skin, a change of pressure, and hearing some murmurs alongside the tickling of a clock. I relaxed slightly for the first time in hours. If people were here, they could be negotiated with, could get me out of the city. I let the door swing shut behind me and prepared my introductions. I really shouldn't have looked down. Meters below me, the floor of the room had one other exit. A wide set of industrial bay doors, but that wasn't the thing making the sound. In the center of the room, there was a plinth, and on it was a person, strapped tightly to a metal gurney. They were probably male judging by the build, but were heavily bandaged and securely bound. On their face, only space around the eyes was left free. Through the gag, a muffled murmur reached the gantry. Words unintelligible, and their pupils were pinpricks, staring unseeing at the dripping roof. On the body, their stomach was exposed, and it writhed, muscles tensing and roiling. Sweat poured off of them, and even on the abdomen, their veins pulsed wildly beneath their skin, more purple than red or blue. My memory trenched, but I shook it off. Something was horrendously wrong. I'd seen addicts before and it was nothing like that. What had I walked into? Kicked back into overdrive, I weighed my options. The passage below was a poor idea. No idea where it led, but whatever the freak this was, I had no part in it. I needed to leave. Now. I just turned around to flee when I heard footsteps echoing toward me from behind that yellow door. Heart plummeting, I spun around, chancing on a vent above me, set it into the wall. Pulling on it, I forced myself inside, and I just returned the grate when the door was thrown open bouncing against the wall. Glancing at the things that had just strolled in, my blood froze in my veins. It was like staring down a bear. Raw power flowed off it in waves. 
It was bound from head to foot in rags, strapped to its slender limbs with rotting leather bands. Juddering and spasming as it strutted inward, I caught the reek of rotting meat and a whiff of engine oil. The head bobbed as it walked, showing a bronze mask that shone dull under the swaying lights. It was near completely plain, without mouth, nose, or features. Across the forehead was a seal, mirroring the others but crossed with a long blade. Pieces slotted into place as I screamed internally. Honey, I'm home. <laughs> I clutched at my throat to stop the scream slipping out into the room. The voice wasn't human. Couldn't be. It appeared between the ears without having the courtesy to knock first, then rang through the air as an afterthought. The tone was artificial, buzzing and blunt, like the thing was reading a script or mimicking a sound rather than speaking a language. My ears burnt and rang like they'd been strained, and I nearly missed the creature's sudden motion. It leapt off the balcony, four meters straight down, and landed without a sound next to the bound man. His eyes were still pinpricks, oblivious to the broken speech or rushing of gusts of air. Hood removed, it threw back its head and screamed, the noise building and peeking into a cackling howl. The mask seemed to blur and pulse in the shaking lights, and my spine was attempting to crawl out my back. I stuck to the other side of the vent, body slammed tight, fingers pressed to my throat and lips to suppress the rise in my breath. Maybe I was pressing too hard, as flashing lights and patches of television static seemed to be crawling across the thing's rags. Uh, <laughs> the laughter pealed and rang through the dark room. Those concrete walls and jagged broken pipes added discordant echoes that lapped back, shuddering in confusion. At odds with the decay, an exquisite carriage clock stood in the corner, ticking away. From my vantage point, it looked alien. A surreal touch of luxury amongst the animalistic backdrop. The ticks and laughs and drips meddled and danced to a beat that I couldn't follow. The figure strapped to the table finally flinched, as though physically struck. A gloved claw stroked gently down their arm, tickling the hairs, and a juddling gasp replaced the laughter, followed by a sucking of teeth. Mmm. Yes. See, all standing up. Erect. It overpronounced the word with inordinate glee. Maybe they were smiling behind the mask. The thing's eyes seemed bright at least, lively, like a child with a new toy. The laughter rang again, and it gently lifted a syringe, proffering it to the table. The contents were a violet hue, rife with suspended motes twinkling like stardust, squirming through the mixture as if they were alive. The light seemed to bend and twist as it passed through the liquid, if that's what it was, sending distorted reflections to the walls. A drip splashed from the tip and ran back down the shaft across the robed fingers. There was something entrancing about the throbbing purple light that drew the eyes. If the needle had been clean, it might have looked pretty. It took so long to perfect it, you know. Years. So many happy little accidents. Your brother was so close. I only got to see it myself the once. When I was born. But you're going to get to go there personally. Aren't you happy? The strapped figure couldn't move its head. But it strained as best it could as the needle moved closer. If that really was one of the Decoughlins, it was no loss. But it was cruel. No one should have to face that monster. Adjusting my view behind the grate, I searched for anything that could help me. But the creature started up once more. Shh, shh, shh. All standing up. Erect. Goosebumps, you call them. Not duck. Strange. Ch -ch -ah -ha. You can tell it's working. Very hard to go, very hard. Humans can't deal with it well. You need a medium. Possibly a large. <laughs> the needle traced against the skin, caressing the exposed stomach, loving arcs and controlled flicks, a practiced and steady hand. A design was being sketched, from belly buttons to ribs edge, and back again, in a series of graceful motions. Tiny scores were left, the picture being exposed, cut by deeper cut, blood rushing to feel the grooves. The figure moaned, and as the design reached completion, his flesh began to hiss and bubble, leaving a purple seal. The great gate sat within a circle of interlocking symbols, in greater detail than before. Grand and austere, it bore a bell, but no latch or keyhole, no obvious means of entrance. I tried to focus, but my vision swam as I stared, the seal radiating majesty and presence at odds with its scale, like it was resisting understanding. The creature's head bobbed, a chain of glistening black drool slipping from under the mask before frantically surfed back. Mm-hmm. Ooh, aha. Aha. <laughs> I wish I could go myself. I want to see it again. I want to. I want to. 
I want to. The Great Divide. The Seventh Gate. Beautiful. An arm was raised high, thumb readied on the plunger. The lady's impatient. <laughs> she really doesn't like to wait. The seconds ticked on, and as 333 showed up on the face, the arm dropped. Suddenly, needle passing through the bell's tongue and deep into flesh, a scream split my head via the ears, rising swiftly in pitch to an inhuman whine. Skin crawling, I stared bug-eyed as light erupted from the design, violet and violent, searing to the senses. As the whine morphed into an electric screech, the shades danced and twisted, space itself flexing and heaving. With a sickening lurch and pressure and a burst of heavy static, the figure vanished, along with the table. Laughter pealed and rang through the dark room. Echoes shook and danced, and they danced with it. It was ugly, crude, violent and jerky, yet impossibly precise. Limbs pulled sharp angles through the air, and balance was adjusted with improbable twitches and spins. Joints pulled far past breaking point, and digits contorted into a melody absent. At odds with the insane surroundings, that gilded clock stood still, taking away. The ticks and laughs and drips and dance pulsed and thrust to a beat no person could follow. It wasn't for us anyway. I pulled myself slowly to the far end of the narrow pipe, inch by inch, terrified of an errant rattle, a careless breath. There, I could feel fresh air from far above. The ticks and twitches and laughter echo on below me, and I'll wait them out. I'll have to. It'll have to go out again at some point. When it's gone, I'll take my chances on the surface, with the monsters I already know.